23% of children told, viewed telling a pro-social lie as good. So this 23% here, but 69% told a pro-social lie themselves. So this tells us that even if they don't, you know, they didn't tell us that they thought telling a pro-social lie was good necessarily, but they still did it. So that tells us they seem to understand our cultural norms, that sometimes it's okay to lie, even if they don't, if that doesn't reflect their moral evaluations. So there are many factors at play that might contribute to this disconnect between their moral understanding of lying as whether it's right or wrong and actual behaviors. It's common that our moral behaviors don't line up with our moral actions. This isn't unique to lying and it's not unique to children. This is something that's, that happens throughout humanity, no matter what age you are. Sometimes you just can't do what you see as, as right. And you know, one reason for this to some extent is that morality can be subjective. There are certain ideals that are valued more strongly in some societies than others, but there's also individual differences in what we each view to be moral or immoral behaviors. And we also differ in how we decide whether it's acceptable to deviate what's considered to be acceptable. And children are learning how to navigate these, these murky waters and these gray areas in morality. And part of how they do that is through observing others, like their parents. And for pro-socialize in particular, most parents will encourage children to lie if they receive a gift that they don't like, just to be polite. So now that we know that kids are lying so much, what can we do to promote honesty in childhood? Now, one study looked at the effects of internal and external appeals for honesty among four to eight-year-old children. And they used the toy guessing temptation resistance paradigm that I showed you at the beginning with, with the duck. And so before the experimenter asked the child if they had peeked at the toy, they just, they first made either an external or an internal appeal for honesty. So an external appeal to tell the truth emphasizes social approval. So the experimenter would say that they'd be happy if the child told the truth. You know, they'd say, if you tell the truth, I will be really pleased with you. I will feel happy if you tell the truth. So here, this is an external appeal for the child to be honest. Whereas an internal appeal, internal appeals to tell the truth emphasize internal standards of behavior by telling, by stating that the children would be happy with themselves if they told the truth. So they'd say, it's really important to tell the truth because telling the truth is the right thing to do when someone has done something wrong. You know, it's really important to telling the truth. So trying to call on that child's internal understanding of morality. And in addition to these appeals for honesty, they also looked at the effects of expectations for punishment. And, within, and they did this within each of the appeal groups. So half the children were told, if you peeked at the toy, you'll be in trouble. And again, this was said to them after they had the opportunity to peek, but before they were asked if they actually did peek. And so the other half of kids were told, if you peeked at the toy, it doesn't matter. No matter what happened, I'm not going to be cross with you or angry with you. So first, when we don't have any appeals, um, this is so lighter gray is no punishment and then the black is with punishment, but we're looking at no appeals. And we can see that children were just as likely to lie in that no appeal condition, regardless of whether they were threatened with punishment. So 87% of kids in this group lied about peaking when they weren't supposed to. Now, when we look at the internal appeal condition, children who received an internal appeal, which emphasized the importance of telling the truth after you've done something wrong, they were far less likely to tell a lie, but only in the absence of punishment. If punishment was given, so this darker bar, then the effect of that internal appeal, it's not strong enough, it wears off, and children are just as likely to lie as if there was no internal appeal. But if you give the internal appeal and don't put that expectation of punishment, we see lying decrease dramatically. But in the external appeal condition, children who received an external appeal, so these are emphasizing social approval by stating that you know, the experimenter would be happy if the kid told the truth. Um, they were even less likely to lie. There was a trend for these kids, um, the punishment external appeal condition. They did kind of lie less, but it wasn't statistically significant. 
compared to this condition. So overall, the best way to promote honesty is to use um, these either an internal or external appeal without expectations for punishment, but this external appeal is even stronger than the internal ones. So let's go into the type of punishment a bit further. What type of punishment? Does that make a difference? Could punishment be effective if it's more harsh or more severe? Or is it more effective when it's less severe? And so research has found that a punitive environment, so characterized by harsh physical or verbal punishment, this has long lasting effects of children and their behavior. It generally increases negative behaviors and including behavior problems and moral transgressions. So in a natural experiment, um, researchers Talwar and Lee looked at three to four year olds in West Africa, and they used that toy guessing game paradigm that I described earlier. And the children came from two types of environments based on their school's discipline tactics. So one group was in, enrolled in a private school that used strict traditional authoritarian discipline models. So we'll call this the punitive school. So in this school, discipline in the form of beating with a stick, slapping of the head or the hand, pinching, all of these things are administered publicly and routinely for offenses ranging from, you know, for getting a pencil or to uh, academic underachievement to being disruptive in class. So the education philosophy of this school is that children need reinforcement in order to learn and that punitive discipline effectively teaches children not to misbehave so that learning will occur. So that was one group. In the other school, um, we had children who were disciplined for similar offenses, but they used things like timeout and scolding. And for more serious offenses, children were taken to the principal's office. And so consistent with previous studies, that used North American children, looked at North Americans' children lie telling, just over half of the children in that non punitive school lied. In contrast, almost all of the children from the punitive school lied. So, this should be noted that the high rate of knowledge concealment, of lying, um, has been found in previous studies only with children over, over the age of six. Um, and when we don't know about punitive parenting or schooling. So these kids in the punitive school, they're three and four years old, they're lying at the rate that six years old, six, seven, eight year olds are lying in North America. So this might tell us, we can't say for sure, but this harsh punishment probably teaches kids to lie earlier and they likely get more practice with it as well. So harsh physical punishment, no big surprise, but it's not necessarily a good route. Um, now, I don't have time to discuss in detail how well these children concealed their lies, but the findings do suggest that children from the punitive school, they're not only more frequently dishonest, but they're also more advanced in their ability to tell convincing lies. So they're, they're learning to be um, deceptive. So in addition to those internal and external appeals for honesty and avoiding punishment, whether it's thresh, uh, threats or something else, there are other tactics that can be useful in promoting honesty among children. So for example, research has found that asking children to promise to tell the truth and make a verbal commitment to do so, that has been shown to reduce lie telling among kids uh, six to 16 years old. And it can also reduce cheating behaviors among four to seven years old. And research has also found that classic moral stories can promote honesty, but only when the positive consequences of honesty are emphasized and not the negative ones. So stories like Pinocchio and the boy who cried wolf, these emphasize that lying is wrong and that bad things will happen to you if you lie. Children who read these stories, they're just as likely to lie in these paradigms as children who read a story that's not related to, to lying. But in one story, uh, George Washington and the Cherry Tree, George Washington gets praised for being honest about doing something bad. So he did something bad, but he, he confessed to it and he was honest and he gets praised for doing so. And children who read this story are significantly more likely to tell the truth themselves as well. So the uh, impact of telling the truth in these stories really matters, the, whether it's good or bad. So to sum up what I've shared with you today, uh, children start lying as early as age two, 
and they do so more often throughout early childhood. Preschoolers' lies are clumsy and ill-formed, but by elementary school, most kids can tell convincing lies. And children understand antisocial lying to be wrong, but they seem to be pretty conflicted when it comes to pro-social lying, which as I said, is common for a lot of adults as well. And children's social environment can greatly impact whether a child is honest or dishonest. So this gave you an overview of some of the topics that I like to explore. And I intentionally highlighted a bunch of work that I myself haven't done, but my uh, mentors and su previous supervisor had done to give you a big picture of the concept. But there are other areas of lying that uh, I'll just mention that I investigate. One line of research that I do is looking at the development of atypical lying. So as I said, all kids tell antisocial lies. It's normal. We normally don't need to worry about it. But some kids develop a pattern of lying that's excessive and problematic, and that can turn into conduct problems. And kids who have severe conduct problems, these are the kids that if they don't get help, they're more likely to engage in illegal behaviors later in life and potentially end up in jail. There are even, they're 20 times more likely to end up incarcerated as adults. So my goal is to figure out why they lie so often. What is it about them and what can we do to prevent that from happening? Another line of my work is looking at lie detection and how can we detect when a child is lying? I kind of alluded to this earlier, but adults are really bad at detecting when a child is lying or telling the truth. And so I'm using um, automatic uh, software that can automatically code children's facial expressions during lie telling. And I'm looking for any markers that we could potentially use to tell when a child is being honest or deceptive. And in another line of work that I started doing more recently is look at adults' perceptions of children's honesty. So I'm looking at how adults perceive a child, they perceive their credibility, and how do they perceive them to be either honest or deceptive? And are they biased? So one of my honor students right now is looking at whether racial bias exists when adults are making decisions as per whether a child is lying or telling the truth. So we're looking at, you know, are adults more likely to believe a, a black child or a white child? You know, are they more likely to think a child is telling a lie or the truth based on their race? And so that's something that we're gonna start data collection on soon. Um, if you have any other questions, either now or anyone watching this later, feel free to shoot me an email. You can also go to my website that's listed at the bottom there. And if you're interested in this, you can go to my media link and get links to um, a YouTube video and a National Geographic work that I've done with these people. And um, they, they did some fun snippets. So if you want to learn a little bit more, you can go to those links. Thank you.